All right, so I'm ready to do the class for October 20th, 2021. <laughs> All right, so I, I pointed out this problem last time. I showed you this is what we were gonna be doing. So let's just read this problem. So this is a problem that, that um, is a, it's a reaction that takes place in what we call a bomb calorimeter. So it's kind of like a big old thing. It's got this very heavy metal, very sealed up container in it with the sample in the middle here. And so you basically ignite a spark and it burns the sample. So you have these wires that you know connect them. And, and then you have a thermometer. And out here we have a, like a jacket with water in it. So this is all H2O on the outside. And so this is the thermometer. So you, you see, you measure the temperature rise. If it's combustion, it's going to be a temperature rise in the surroundings. And um, basically, we know that the change in um, that the change in internal energy is equal to the heat that flows at constant volume. All right, and that heat, that Q, um, is generally given by the number of moles times the heat capacity at constant volume times the change in temperature. But you can see that the equation we use here is delta U is minus C delta T. So these two are kind of combined together in what we call the calorimeter constant. And another thing is there's this negative sign. And that's because clearly you can't measure the temperature rise. Uh, sorry, you can't measure the system. The system would be losing heat, so its temperature would be going down. But the individual molecules, you can't put thermometer there. You can only measure the temperature rise out here in the surroundings. Um, and so you have to change the sign because if, we, if, if the system is losing heat, right, it's exothermic right, then delta U must be negative. And if we didn't have the negative sign here and the temperature goes up in the surroundings, we'd have a positive um, delta U, which is just doesn't make any sense. So that's why we have to put the negative sign there. So that's, so that's um, the first thing, that's what's going on in this problem is we have um, it happening in this constant volume calorimeter surrounded by water. And so, um, um, what you're asked to find out, so you're given this calorimeter constant and you're given the temperature rise, the delta T, and what you're asked to figure out is the delta U for this process, which means for the 1.30 grams of ethane. So that's, I really sometimes refer to this as delta U total. This is for the mass that's reacting, right? It's not for one mole, it's just for 1.308 grams of ethane. Then it asks, what is the per mole delta U, which is, we often just put a little zero there because this is the standard um, um, internal energy change. And one of the things that makes it standard is it's per mole of everything with a coefficient of one in the reaction, which I'll write later. So standard per mole. And then you're also asked to find out what is the delta H zero, the delta H per mole? Okay, um, so that's what we're going to do. And the way we're going to start it is by finding the delta U according to this equation right here. So we're going to use that right off the bat. And you're given the fact that this constant, let's see. Oh yeah, here we go. It's minus 10.42 kilojoules per degree C. And that gets multiplied by the um, 6.3, oh, sorry. What was the temperature here? Yeah, 6.46. I actually have 6.461 in my notes. I don't know why, maybe I changed the problem at some point, but that makes the Delta U equal to negative 
67.32. I guess I wanted it to have four sig figs. Kilojoules, as your degrees C, cancel. So this is a total change in internal energy. The delta U total. Okay. Um, so so the, the things we have to get from the other things we have to get are we have to get, like I said, the delta U per mole and the delta H per mole. Um, so there's two ways that we could proceed. Um, so I'm going to tell you what these two ways are, and I'm going to tell you which one I think is, is easier and probably what you should use. Um, but here's the two ways. Number one, okay, number one, uh, let hold on a sec. Uh, I thought it was a little bit off. Okay, so the two ways to proceed. Number one is we can use the delta U to get the molar um, delta U, in other words, the delta U zero, and then get the delta H zero from the delta U zero using one of our equations. And the equation would be that delta H, well, we have several choices like this. This is one of the choices. The other ones, that we went over last time. Okay, so, so what's happening in this reaction is it's a combustion reaction and there is a change in the moles of gas, okay? So let me just write the reaction down. C2H6 plus oxygen goes to two CO2 and three H2O. And there's seven halves here to balance the equation. Okay, so, um, so what's happening here is that the volume is changing. And so we could use this one, but it'd be harder to, to use. The appropriate equation to use here is actually this one. And what we need to eventually to do is get a change in moles. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Um, so, okay, that's the first method that we could use. All right, there, there's a change in moles of gas and we could um, get the molar delta U, which we call delta U zero. And we could use that to get the delta H zero using this equation here. All right, that's the first thing. The second thing is just doing it in a bit of a different order. Okay, so the second thing is to get the total change in enthalpy, right, from the total delta U. So these are total, not per mole. So we would use the same equation, but um, we would do it for the whole amount, not the molar amount. Turns out it's much easier to figure out this delta N if you do it using the molar amount, because then you're figuring out what is the change in moles of gas per one mole of ethane, right? There's a one there. Um, and, and it's just easier to figure that out because it's pretty obvious. You can just use the stoichiometry to figure that out. If you have the total change, it's a little more difficult, but I'll show you both methods so you'll know. So it's to get the total change in delta H from the total delta U and then di uh, divide by the moles to get delta H zero, right? So that's delta H total over the moles. You know, it seems very trivial. Am I, am I using a molar delta H or not? But actually it, it, it's, it's really two quite different ways of doing the problem. And you'll see that um, that one, I, I think has a real advantage over the other. And so I would recommend you use that method. Okay, 
So method one, my method of choice, is method one. Okay, and in method one, we start, of course, in the same place, 67.32 kilojoules. Um, that's the delta U total, right? You burn this 1.3 something grams of ethane, and this is the delta U that you get by using the minus C delta T for burning 1.6, 1 point whatever it is, grams of ethane. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out what is the molar delta U. So delta U zero is delta U total divided by the number of moles. So what is the number of moles? So we have 1.308 uh, grams of C2H6 with a molar mass of 30. And so that means that we have 0 0.0435 moles of C2H6. I wouldn't mind getting another sig fig there. Oh, I should have had more. 043495, so it's just 50, okay? So that's the mole. So now I'm going to find my delta U. Zero is six, minus 67. 0.32 kilojoules over 0 0.04350 moles. So now I'm going to have kilojoules per mole, okay? And that comes out to negative 1547.7. I keep it, oh, 0.6. I always keep an extra digit. Come on, let me erase, let me erase. Oh, I think this computer is getting heated up. <laughs> And I erased the wrong thing. <laughs> Kilojoules per mole. So now we have the molar um, change in internal energy. So next, we're going to find delta H0 from delta U0. And we're going to use this formula that we developed at the end of the last class. OK. Um, all right. And you know, if you rearrange this, just FYI, it shows you, because delta U is Q plus W, that this is the work. So if you wanted to calculate the work, that's how you could calculate it. Remember, delta H is Q at constant pressure, since the pressure is constant. We can say that delta H is Q, or we could put a P there to make sure you know that we realize it's constant pressure. All right, so now we're going to find delta H0 from delta U0 using this formula. And um, so really, what we're going to do is delta U, uh, sorry, delta H0 equals delta U0 plus RT. And now what is the delta N going to be here? Now, since these are per mole quantities, what we are looking for is what is the change in moles per mole of C2H6? And for that, we go back and look at this equation that I've written already. So maybe I'll, I'll do a cut and paste and move it down. Did I pass it? Yeah. I'll do a. Of course, it's not going to work, right? It's having a little problem. Okay, so how about if I copy it? Can I do that? Oh. I'll try it one more time and then I'm going to give it up. All right, I did it. So here's the equation. So, you know, normally we write these, you know, where we're talking about the combustion of ethane, we might 
you know, force this, force this coefficient to be one so that we could say per mole of ethane. If this coefficient were a two and we knew what the delta H or delta U was, we'd have to say per two moles of ethane because the delta U or delta H for this reaction, whatever it comes out to, is per one mole of whatever has a one, per two moles of whatever has a two, and per three moles of whatever has a three, and per seven half moles of anything that has a seven halves. But if you're only combusting one mole of C2H6, we have to ask ourselves, what is the change in moles of gas? Because it's the gas that is responsible for any contribution to work. And work is what makes the difference between delta H and delta U. Because when gas is, is generated, it does work on the atmosphere. If gas is taken away, work is done on the system. All right, so let's count up the moles of gas. On the right-hand side, we have two, right? Because uh, water is a liquid. On the left-hand side, we have seven halves. We have nine halves, right? Seven halves plus one. Okay, so the final minus initial moles of gas is two minus nine halves. Something is wrong here. Yeah, no, that's right. Four halves minus nine halves is negative five halves or minus 2.5. That is the delta N. This is the change in moles of gas per mole of C2H6 that, reacting, that reacts. Okay, so if I go back up to this equation here, whoa, sorry, I need to do that. That's good. <clears throat> to go back up to this, this is the delta N. This delta N is going to be um, negative 2.5. And actually, let's do that. Let's do delta H zero equals delta U zero. plus RT delta N. Yeah. Okay, so, um, I think I can tell, yeah. So this is, the delta U was negative 15, 47.6. Let me make sure I have the right number. Yep plus this R, now this is kilojoules per mole. So I wanna use R in a, in a similar, you know, in the right unit. So I'm gonna use kilojoules per mole Kelvin. So that's why I'm using 8.314 times 10 to the negative three. That's R in kilojoules per mole Kelvin. And then I have to multiply by the T, which is 298, says that's somewhere in the problem. And then by the delta N. And of course I ran out of space. I don't know what's the wrong, what's going on here. Not very well organized. All right, so you could see I paused a little and, and I um, rearranged the writing so I could fit this all in one line. And, and you'll notice what I did here. I put all the units in and, and <laughs> The units here, the change in the moles is actually minus 2.5 moles of gas that's generated or, or lost actually per mole of C2H6 reacting. So its unit is actually moles per mole. It's like moles of gas, the change in the moles of gas per mole that reacts. And if I didn't have moles per mole, then I wouldn't end up with kilojoules per mole. And I really need to end up with that because this is a per mole, I'm calculating the per mole quantity. So this ends up being minus 1547.6, um, C minus 6.19, and that is minus 
15, 54, because really I only had the, those uh, fewer sig figs, minus 15, 54 kilojoules per mole. So this is now the delta H zero, the, the molar change in enthalpy for this process, okay? Um, so I would recommend that when you do the delta N, that you use the per mole quantity. You may not always be able to do that, but um, let's do the method the second way, just to show you that that was complicated enough and it actually is a little bit crazier this way. So what do you do when you want to get the, um, so, the so let's just start again. The other way is to use the delta H that was, sorry, the delta U that was calculated in the very first step which is the total delta U to get the total delta H, okay? And then get the molar delta H by dividing by the number of moles. That's at the end. So we still are gonna to get to the same spot. We're gonna get the molar delta H just like we have here, but we're gonna do it a different way. And it's harder to calculate the um, change in moles when we do it this way. So let's think about that. Um, what is delta N going to be in this case? So we're going to use that delta H is delta U plus RT delta N. Now we know when this is the molar quantity, this is molar, that we use the delta N that's moles per mole of ethane that reacts. But since this is for the totals, the total delta H, the total delta U, um, we have to use, we must use the total moles of ethane and multiply that. Hi, so I lost a little um, bit of time there. I'm not sure quite what I said, but we're going to use this equation here. But now um, we have to use the total moles of ethane to calculate a delta n. We can't just um, look at the stoichiometric coefficients. So we know that there's minus 2.5 moles of gas per mole of ethane, okay, that's reacted. And now we have to multiply that by the moles of ethane. So did we ever figure out, we did figure out the moles of ethane. We must have when we divided by it back here. So this was the moles of ethane over here that we got over here, 0 0.04350. So what we have to do is multiply this by the moles of ethane. This is why I don't encourage you to do it this way because you will get the total moles. This is going to be the total change in moles of gas for this reaction. And it comes out to negative 0 0.1088 is the total change in the moles of gas. So delta, delta H is delta U plus RT delta N. Let's go ahead and plug in. Let me just make sure we have the delta U that we calculated at the beginning. Let's go back to the delta U. There it is, negative 67.32 kilojoules. Okay. Oh, that's the delta U zero. Wait a minute, hold on. This, oh no, right, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't delta U zero yet. Right, I have to divide to get to the delta U zero. So this is very confusing now. I should have left that alone, right? <laughs> but no, I have to go a step up further up here. This is what I want. This is my delta U. Negative, it was negative 67.32. And that's kilojoules plus 8.314 times 10 to the minus 3 kilojoules per mole Kelvin times 298 Kelvin times negative 0 0.1088 moles. And this moles will now cancel that moles because it's no longer moles per mole. We multiplied by the moles of that thing. So now we have negative 
kilojoules minus a very small 0.2696 kilojoules. So that's what this equals, 0.2696. So, you know, you get negative 67.59. So now, if you want to find the molar amount, you would just divide that by the number of moles. Guess what? We get negative 15.54 kilojoules per mole. As it better work out too. So, you know, it seems like a really trivial thing. You know, when do you divide by the moles? But it's a whole lot easier to do your delta H, delta U kind of conversions if they're per mole quantities, because then it's easy to figure out what the change in the moles of gas is. Um, there are other subtleties in this in this type of problem there are other things that i have not something i haven't mentioned okay so we use this equation here delta h is delta u plus rt delta n and we assumed that the temperature is constant so let me ask you something is the temperature really constant in a combustion reaction you know, you burn this thing in pure oxygen, it generates a lot of heat, the temperature changes. So how is it that I can use an equation where I assume that the temperature is constant, okay? And this is one of the lovely mysteries of physical chemistry that I'm going to explain right now, okay? So here it is. The temperature is not constant, it changes for a while. Remember you have this bomb inside this water bath, right? Here's the water bath. And the thermometer is out here. And you start at a certain temperature. And then the temperature goes up and you measure that in the thermometer inside the surroundings. But what's happening to the system is its heat is leaving. It's going into the surroundings over here in the bath and is recorded as an increase in temperature. But at the beginning of the reaction, it's at 25 degrees C. So then the reaction happens. The temperature climbs. And then the heat gets transferred out. And then at the end, the temperature inside the what we call the bomb the sample compartment here, right in here, is back to 25. So that's really all that the internal energy cares about is that the, the temperature went back to what it was at the beginning. Okay, so there is a change in temperature, but by the end of the reaction, temperature changes back, the temperature is back to what it was before. There's no overall change in temperature. The temperature doesn't lead to a change in the internal energy because it goes back to where it was before. And so we don't care, and neither does delta U. what happened to the temperature in between. You know, all we care about is that the temperature at the beginning is the same as the temperature at the end. And the reason why we don't care what happened in between is because internal energy is a state function. And it only depends on the current conditions. And so that's one of the lovely mysteries of physical chemistry that we could say, run the reaction at a constant temperature. But of course you have reactions are exothermic, they're endothermic, the temperature changes, but then they're over and the temperature goes back to what they were before. And that's what we're talking about. That's the number that we're giving is the delta U for when you know everything goes back to the way it was and the reaction happened and the heat went somewhere and we accounted for that but we don't have to worry about the change in temperature 
because the internal energy is a state function. And that's sort of the beauty of the whole thing, or one of them anyway. Let's see. Okay, so here's the next problem. Okay, so what is delta H for vaporizing? Oh, hold on. For vaporizing 100 grams of liquid water at the boiling point, 100 degrees C, which is, by the way, 373 Kelvin. Okay, so here, so in the first problem, we were given stuff that would allow us to figure out delta U, you know, we were given the C and the delta T. Here, we're given the delta H zero, the heat of, of vaporization. This is per mole. So this is for one mole of water, not for 100 grams, okay? So this is the molar standard enthalpy. We will talk about what these standard enthalpies are next week. Standard enthalpy of vaporization of water. Okay, and it's at, to vaporize at the boiling point. So we need to calculate, let's see what it's asking for. It's asking for what is delta U for this process? Okay, so that is like asking for the total delta U for its, because it's delta U for the process of vaporizing 100 grams. So it's the total delta U. So what's constant here? And this isn't even, uh, we don't even have to play that game about the initial and the final. What's constant here is the temperature. This is a phase change and we get no temperature change until all the liquid is converted to gas. Okay, so temperature is constant. So we actually use the same relation as before. You could also use this one, uh, but I think this one is the, the easiest to use. So I'm going to show you that one. And what I'm going to do, so I have to get the delta U, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to, you know, there's two, like I said, there's two ways to, do, to go about doing this. Um, oh, and by the way, we would write this in terms of delta U. Oh, hold on a sec. <gasps> so again, there are two ways you can approach this. Okay, we're trying to get the delta U total. We're given the delta H zero, the molar. So we could take and find the molar delta U from the molar delta H. And then from that, we can get U, sorry, delta U. The other way would be to take the delta H zero and get delta H and then get the delta U from that. This would be the total delta H. And we're gonna go with this because I find it easier to go from delta U to delta H using the molar quantities. So here we're trying to get delta U from delta H. So we need to rearrange this and it's gonna be minus RT delta N, okay? And now, um, I want to remind you what you're looking at here. <laughs> okay, I keep saying this, but it's good to keep it up. So we know from the first law, again, this is the first law, but here we have constant pressure. And so this is QP, which is delta H. So that is to say that this is the work. Okay. Now um, we're going to use the per mole quantity so we're going to use the delta H zero to get the delta U zero. 
And now, what is this delta n? What number do I use here? All right, now this is per mole, right? We're going to take care of the fact that it's not per mole later. So, you know, it says, what is delta H vaporizing 100 grams? But you're given the per mole quantity. And if you find the delta U per mole, what you're simply going to use is the one mole because one mole is what you're vaporizing. So what do you use here? One mole is being, oh well, one mole, well, 100 grams is being vaporized, but we're doing the per mole analysis first. Then we're gonna multiply through by the number of moles. So we use one mole because this, because we are using per mole delta U and delta H, okay? So this is just gonna be one. So we have delta U zero is delta H zero minus RT times one, okay? And notice that temperature and R, these are both positive. So the work is going to be negative. Does that make sense? Remember, this is a work here. Work should be negative because we're going from a liquid to a gas. We are generating gas. When you generate gas, it does work. The system is doing work on the surroundings. So the work should be negative. So that works, that's, that, that's great. So let's go back. What is our delta H zero? Is 40.65 kilojoules per mole minus 8.314 times 10 to the minus three kilojoules per mole Kelvin times, okay, now here the temperature, that's 100 degrees C, it's 373 Kelvin, showed you that before. And this is one mole of gas generated per one mole of, of water vaporizing, okay? So again, those will cancel um, and you'll end up with kilojoules per mole here as, as you should. So this is 40.65 kilojoules per mole minus 3.10. So you can see what's going on here, at least in the per mole analysis, you have a very substantial amount of heat that's going into the system You have a smaller amount of work done in vaporizing. So you have two contributions to delta U. So the delta U is overall is going to be positive. And that's because the, the, um, this, the magnitude of this term is greater because the magnitude of the heat contribution, which is the delta H is greater. Okay. All right, so now we have the delta U zero. Well, the sum is, what is it? 37.6, that's delta U zero. Um, so now we have to take our delta U, we have to find delta U, that's going to be delta U zero times the number of moles, okay? And um, let's figure out the number of moles, right? We had 100 grams, 18.01 grams per mole. That's 5.55 moles. So this becomes 37.6 kilojoules per mole times 5.55 moles. And that is 208.4 kilojoules per mole. A oh, kilojoules, not per mole. All right, we got rid of the per mole. Because this is now delta U total. 
um, what if you wanted the work done, right? What if you want the amount of work done in the entire process? All right, we just do, we don't want it just for one mole. What if we want the work done in the entire process? Well, you can use the fact that delta U is Q plus W here at constant pressure. Okay, so now delta U minus delta H is the work. So simply take the 208.4 kilojoules minus, uh, Hold on. <laughs> ah. Oh, I never found the total. Ah. Yeah, I never found this. <laughs> yeah, I need to know what is the total delta H. And that's delta H zero times the number of moles. So that would be 40.65 kilojoules per mole times 5.55 moles or 225.6 kilojoules. And that's what goes here. So this is total delta U minus total delta H it gives you the, the total work that was done. And so this is, because um, it comes out to be negative 17.6 kilojoules. So delta U is Q plus W, here's the work. Um, the heat was 208, right? This was, this is our delta H, and this is, this was the difference between the two, this is the work. Um, hold on, something is not right. Yeah, so what's wrong here is I put in the delta U here and not the delta H. This is 225.6. And when you subtract that, you actually get 208. I think 0.4. So what you can see again, you know, the same thing is that you put quite a bit of heat, quite a bit of heat went into the system. Um, Q is pretty positive. Delta H, which is Q, is, is quite positive. Small negative work. So overall, the system's internal energy increased. Delta U was positive. Okay. Um, yeah. So a substantial amount of heat flowed into the system. A small amount of work was done. Okay. So, so in the end, delta U increases significantly.